Welcome to part 3, Project Decagon. This video is going to talk about three things that I didn't talk about yet, and it is the durability, the powertrain, and the water cooling. Why these three things? Well, if you put that much power in a machine like this, something's going to give. And I don't want anything to give on that machine, so that's why we need to work on these things. So first thing first, I talked about the water cooling system previously slightly in the uh, power system and electronic video. So uh, this is going to be more of the cooling system more than the component of the electronics and how they work together. So without further ado, let's dive right in. So as you can see, it's pretty filled up inside cooling. We have electronics, we have battery, all that stuff. If I need to cool the electronics, I need to have a, a place where I can dump the heat. And in this case, it is in the tunnel itself. I have a plate here that basically has a hole inside so the water can flow inside and cool uh, the hot liquid, uh, hot water, um, the coolant basically. When I designed the first uh, 150 scale snowmobile, I designed this part to be uh, machined so it could have an aluminum plate that would be on top of it that would allow the, the liquid to flow and touch the aluminum but on the other side it would have been plastic but I've tried I think this part five times at uh, different methods and all of them leaked at some point so I decided to give up on that idea and instead go for a full aluminum piece basically like this you have a channel here inside so uh, the, the bungs they're connected here and here and the water flows through it and you have an aluminum plate on each side and it is extremely effective i've never had any problem with heat so this is more than sufficient you don't want the water to be too cold when it hits the speed controller because it could create some condensation i have a reservoir here so the pump takes the coolant from the reservoir goes in the pump then goes in the heat exchanger or the, the radiator and then it goes to the motor the reason it goes in the motor first is that it's going to preheat the water slightly so it doesn't want to do as much condensation once it gets to the speed controller so it goes from the motor into a little filter which is a standard nitro filter uh, it's mainly just for big particles and then it goes in the speed controller where i have machined two aluminum pieces to dissipate the heat of the mosfets so after it goes from there, it goes back into this little reservoir here. The only reason I have this reservoir is because this is a closed system, so it's not vented to the atmosphere. So it's sort of a buffer, so there's no overflow. And if there's some air bubbles in the system, they're all going to end up here and it doesn't uh, cause problem inside. The pump I'm using for this is a gear type pump because in case the air bubbles, they go in the line because it's shaking a lot because yes, this this is a pretty wild ride if you ask me so sometimes there are air bubbles in the system and they go in the pump so if it was a centrifugal pump there would be a high chance of the pump stalling because of the air bubbles and would not be uh, capable of self-priming itself it could probably do it if it's lucky and there's not too many uh, air bubbles but normally a gear type prevents that because it can uh, it can take the air bubbles out and still be able to pull some uh, some coolant. Now, in the nitro snowmobile, something I've done is that I've used some standard uh, distilled water and Preston, but in this one, I decided to try something that had no water inside. That's why I got this Evans waterless coolant. So basically, this has no water inside. So that means if it gets close to 100 degrees Celsius, boiling point of water, this is not going to boil. It should never get anywhere close these temperatures. But the main reason I used it is that if it goes, uh, if, if the pump is super efficient and you know, too much heat dissipation, this will not freeze at zero either. And you don't need to have Preston in the line to prevent that. So uh, Preston does sometimes leave some residue inside the lines and stuff like that. This is not gonna leave any residue, but there's a downside to it. So I have a sample here. And uh, if I move it around a little bit, it's, it feels like oil uh, in the consistency. So it's not as um, liquid as water. I know liquid is not the proper term, but you get the idea. It's a little bit thicker. So it's a bit more difficult for the pump to pump this stuff around. And something that I've realized is that 
when I start the pump, the level in the buffer gets a little bit lower. And I think that's because the hoses are expanding a little bit, which could cause that to happen. But since this is a shield system, it's, it's weird because uh, it shouldn't have any air coming in. So I think it's creating a vacuum of some sort. So it's definitely not something good, but I have had some success running it with that. And if I do realize at some point that it's causing problem, it's simple. I'm just going to switch back to distilled water and press them because I know it works perfectly in the nitro snowmobile. The downside to using that product is that it's not as efficient as water at cooling a machine like this because it doesn't have thermal dissipation unit. I'm not sure what the name of it is, but I can put it here. It's not as efficient as a cooling medium. So, um, cause I've tested water and that stuff and water is a couple degrees, like five or six degrees cooler under the same kind of load and situation. So if I really have some problems in the future, I will just switch back to water. It's not a problem. So that's about it for the water cooling system. Now let's move on to the drivetrain. I have a big motor inside and a big power system, big battery. I need to move this thing around and it's a heavy machine. It has plenty of power to move it, but you need to watch out because these gears need to be able to pull that sled forward with all that power in front of it. From the very start of the project, something I did is that the main spear gear, normally it's plastic. I think it's a Dalrin plastic. I was expecting it not to be able to withstand the power of this machine. So from the get-go, I went to stay, to uh, to metal. But I realized uh, that was not the only thing that would pull me back. Uh, the gears I had before were sort of a vented gear. Let me show you. So it was a gear like this. Uh, there's some venting inside so it can move some air around, which was a good idea. But the thing is, um, they're sort of welded together. But that was that was from the nitro snowmobile because the the gearbox plate moved, so they were out of alignment, so they melted each other and they fused to each other, which was pretty cool. Um, it's not nice, but it's cool, I guess. I decided that the gears would be 100% filled, no venting in place, just make it as tough as possible. So that's what I did. And it went fine for a couple of rides, but then I started to have some other problems here and there. I think the plastic that I used for these were a little too soft. So with the high power and heat and friction, they eventually melted together. So now what I'm doing is that I'm using high temperature plastic. So it's a, it's high temperature PLA or heat resistant PLA. And I've never had a problem with these gears. Uh, from friction, but I have another problem that I had for that and it's a bit hard to explain because I took it apart But normally the axle um, Inside of the gear if you just have plastic It's going to explode because the plastic if it takes an impact it's going to delaminate in, this, in the Direction of the axle. So what I do is inside the axle I put either a stainless or carbon fiber insert so it doesn't so it does not deform under the high loads and forces but something I really didn't expect is that even though my gear mesh is really good inside of this at some point the gears just the friction from moving the gear around the bearing all the forces sort of heated up the plastic and it melted the axle not the alum not the stainless but it melted the plastic around it and it completely deformed the gears so that's the last revision I've done with this is this gear inside. So basically the axle is a solid chunk of stainless steel because it doesn't rust. So uh, it's the exact diameter of the bearing. So in theory, the bearing hold the axle on each side and it cannot move apart from just rotating. So it cannot go side to side or something like that. The only way for that gear to fail now would be if the center of the axle would get so hot that it would melt the plastic around it, but I'm sure it cannot happen. I mean, it's a big mass now and there's not that much load uh, from the axle to the gear because the gear is just a medium of transfer, but I guess you never know. I've never had a problem since then. Uh, the gears de seem to uh, do pretty well. If you watched the last video about Project Decagon, you might have seen that I exploded the track. And when that happened, it seems like every time the gearbox fails, the gear normally don't fail first. This is the third pinion that I've lost teeth on. This is another one. It's 
missing like half of its teeth. So the Metal Gear is definitely doing its job, but now the pinion is taking a beating. The thing is, these are cast one. So the one I have in now is a machine and hardened, so it should not fail anymore. The main bearings for this machine, since it has so much power, I decided to go the safe route. I know ceramic is a little bit brittle when you have some impacts to it. I just didn't want to take any chances. So the bearings inside of this, they are uh, metal with titanium coating on them. And yes, it sorts of want to rust, but it's really efficient. And I've had plenty of runs on it. And worst case scenario, at, this, at the end of the season or at the end of two seasons, I'm going to replace them. It's not a problem. Now the last part of the drivetrain is the track. When I did the video that the track blew up, it had a new type of filament that I was experimenting with. And obviously the layer height was not sufficient in between the layers. So it's sort of delaminated under the high centrifugal forces. After all, it blew up at like 94 kph. Now I'm using the Polymax stuff. That's the best stuff I've found to use for track material because it's uh, it's it has some give. You know when you bed a plastic and you have some white lines appear inside? That's the same kind of property that this material has. Of course, it's a different story in the cold, but it's a lot better than standard PLA. I know some people have suggested me to use some uh, PETG or ABS. But truth being told, ABS is too soft and PTG is too brittle for my experiment. So that's the best material I have. And the track that's inside of this has never failed. I think I've lost maybe one or two lugs out of like a dozen drive that I have. And for the power this thing has, I'm not even worried. That's plenty sufficient and I know it can handle the power. All right, so we've talked about the water cooling system. We've talked about, we've talked about the drivetrain. Now let's talk about the durability stuff. This is the heaviest machine I've ever built. So when you land weird with that machine, there's a lot of forces applied to it, a lot more than what Schottky would be exposed to. So it needs to be extra strong to withstand these kind of impacts. So what I'm doing for this machine, there's a lot of stuff that went into making it more durable, but something I really like to do is to use some carbon fiber pieces like this five millimeter axle, for example, and reinforce some parts that are critical. So one of them, is the skid itself. You can bend it a little bit and it has some give to it, but when you add some carbon fiber, you cannot do anything. Like you can barely bend it and you cannot snap it. I've tried it. I've never had somebody that was able to bend it by hand. So I know it's plenty strong enough to withstand the blows that this thing's going to take. I've had some problems in the past where the tunnel would uh, do a wheelie and the, the top end of the tunnel would bend backward and snap. So I have two carbon fiber axles that are inside the tunnel to add some strength to it as well. And since I've been doing that, I've never had one fail. Obviously you cannot put carbon fiber everywhere. You need to be able to, you know, put it at places where it's most necessary. Carbon fiber is expensive. So you don't want to have just carbon fiber everywhere. Sometimes carbon fiber can be more heavy than the equivalent of say aluminum or plastic. It all depends on what shape the material is, what sort of carbon fiber you have, what makes. There's a lot of factors that goes into it. But if you have something that is pre-made like these axles, usually they're pretty stiff. You cannot use carbon fiber directly against friction material. So say you want to have some wheels here at the top that spins, you, can have an, you cannot have an axle that drives the wheels directly on the carbon fiber because it will sort of melt the carbon fiber and it will pick up some carbon and then it will grind it. It will, it will literally chop your carbon fiber in half after a little while. So. I've had that happen, so you need some layer in between to prevent friction directly against carbon fiber. And the two wheels are within a bearing, so the bearing obviously takes the load and prevents friction. It's absolutely not necessary. I could have put something like a, a stainless steel shaft or brass shaft, and it would have been perfect. But, you know, extra strength for these big impacts is always welcome. You might see in my upcoming videos that I had a problem with my rear uh, bumper because I did some wheelies and you know sometimes you'd stuff under the snow and it bumps it and one of my rear bumper blew up and it's slightly out of out of shape so I decided to go for a company that I know that makes some really tough part. Mark Forged is the company of printers that make um, it's like a nylon with carbon fiber uh, pieces within it. It's called Onyx. And uh, they have a printer that can print that material 
with also carbon fiber strands. So in theory, you can have a part that is lighter than aluminum and much stronger as well. And it's 3D printed, so it's pretty awesome. So I sent him, uh, there's a guy near me that has a printer like that. So I sent him the file of the rear section of the bumper and he got me this. So I know it looks like any other printed parts and it's a little flexible in that direction. But in this direction here, you cannot, you cannot break this. It has a carbon fiber all around the pieces. Here's a picture of what the inside looks like. All the blue lines are carbon fiber lines. So it will not break in that direction. So I just take that part and put it there. But, you know, sometimes, sometimes it's just not enough. So if it breaks, I've never had any problems with that, these parts before, but if it breaks and I need to replace it again, I'm not going to reuse again that material because now, I have some solid carbon fiber pieces. Look at that. It's real carbon fiber. It's the high quality stuff. And I have a few bumpers like this. So if I do sell some units in the future, there's a good chance some of them might have this solid carbon fiber. And you know, it's a long piece, so it can add some support all the way to the back, up to the seat and parts that are really important. And the rear axle is not going to break because it's also carbon fiber. So. Like this, you have carbon fiber on the side and you have carbon fiber going across and like that. So it's really, really tough material. So if I ever have a problem with that bumper, I have this. A lot of people like when I go in details about my design. So I'm going to go a little bit in details on the tensioning system. I'm going to do my best to explain it, but it's not necessarily an easy thing to explain. Say you're doing a wheelie and you land upright like that. All the force is going to be applied directly on the rear wheels and it's going to push the, all the load forward, right? Makes sense. But now, this is the little part that I have my tensioning system attached to. So here you see where the axle goes with the wheels. And if I push directly forward, what it wants to do is to go like, if I'm holding it like that, it wants to go up like that. So if you have a really high load, it's going to want to bend the tensioning system axle. So what I had to do is add a little piece that prevents it from pushing down. So it's a little wing, I call it like a little bird because it has some little bird's wing shape. So basically what it does is it pushes down and it just glides across the skid. So it transferred the weight from going down to going just straight ahead. And I've never had a problem with them after that. The axle I'm using now is a carbon fiber uh, tube, like a round tube. It's super lightweight. It's also what I've used on Chatki and it does the job wonderfully. Never had a problem with them. Something also important to note is that sometimes going hard material like carbon fiber is not always the solution. So if you have something that's really exposed to the elements, say this handlebar right here, if you flip around and it, you have something really hard and tough, Usually it snaps, but if you have something flexible like that, you cannot, you cannot break this. It's, it's just, it's going to bend and it's just not going to break. So some parts you, you can go harder or better material, but at some point just going softer is actually the solution. So I have a few parts in the machine that are made of TPU, which is a flexible polymer. So I have the handlebar that are flexible. I have the lower A arms and sometimes the spindles. This one is hard spindles, but sometimes uh, soft spindles actually goes a long way and it helps dampen uh, hard bumps and it helps the suspension a little bit. The last thing I'm going to talk about today is shocks. Normally I'm using a shock like this. This is my own design. So you have a little canister like that and you have this part which is basically a rod end on an axle. So you put one and two together and you put a little block inside that's, a, that's just a collar, like a one eighth collar, one scan. You put it in, you tighten up and it locks inside and you cannot uh, pull it out. And then you add a little spring and that's it, you have a shock. What you would want to have is a dampened system. So like with oil shocks. Here's a good example of one I really like. Their product, they're G-Mate shocks and they work really, really nice on most of the machine I've put them on. But there's a downside to it. This is heavier than the stuff I've made before. But the main downside is that it can work flawlessly at room temperature, but when you go outside and it's minus 20 or minus 30, you know, that oil gets really, really thick. So you can take the snowmobile and drop it and it's just going to 
crash down. It like it doesn't want to dampen. It's just going to try to compress the shocks and it's solid. So that can break stuff actually. But I have some really light oil inside of these shocks. The reason, like the, the main reason after all this that I'm using these shocks on that machine is that I could not find a shock, like a spring like that, that was hard enough to withstand the weight of this entire beast. So I had to use these shocks and most of them are cranked up pretty high. You can see where the little uh, compression ring is. It's very low. So most of them are getting close to maxed out. And so I have some piggybacks in the front because they look cool. And I have some aeration in the back because the piggyback would not fit inside the tunnel. So the only downside again is that in the cold oil, it's no good. It's, it's too stiff. So that's about it for this machine. There's a lot of stuff that goes into it and I didn't go in details about everything, but it gives you a good idea on what went into it. Now, I know you want to see it run. The upcoming video is the first run I've ever done on that machine in the snow. So thanks for watching and thanks for riding with me. It means a lot to me, so have a nice day. This is a big day. This is finally the day I'm going to test this thing. This thing is worth more than my car. <laughs> So what I really like about this transmitter is that you can have everything that you need to watch out. Since my motor is overvolted, I need to watch out for my RPMs, temperature for the driver, temperature for the motor, and uh, I'm waiting for a sensor for the battery, and one of them is the BEC for internal electronics. Really happy with this transmitter. It's really overkill for something like this, but that's the only one that offered all the features and a quick response time for something like this. So without further ado. That's just this thing. It's like I can pull your foot. Oh my god. You know when this is too much. This is clearly too much. So far I didn't go above half throttle.